Okay, then I will say hi everyone and welcome to another Albany Pinebush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pinebush Community. Uh, we co-sponsor with commission staff our monthly science lecture webinars. Uh, before we start today's program, Winter Climate Change in Northeastern Forests, two housekeeping notes. First, as questions occur to you during today's presentation, we suggest you use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen to type your question. And Dylan will direct your questions then to our speaker at the end. Uh, please think of, please add them whenever you feel, uh, whenever you think of them. Second, our March 18th, 7 p.m. program will be an ecological history of the Albany pine bush. And our presenter will be Skylar Murphy from Paul Smith's College. His senior capstone presentation was the first paleoecological exploratory investigation of the wetlands located in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. Interesting that samples taken can provide a continuous environmental history, not only of plant diversity through trap pollen, but also regionalized fires indicated by remnant charcoal. So uh, I'm not sure I understand all that, but it sounds pretty cool. So now on to Dylan to introduce today's program. Back to you, Dylan. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Dr. Colin Fuss. Um, Dr. Fuss is up at SUNY Plattsburgh. Um, he's a faculty member up there and he's been there now for two years, but he's been in New York for quite some time now. Um, he went to Cornell um, and uh, majored in biology for his undergraduate degree. Um, and then he went a little north up to uh, Syracuse University for grad school, where he studied um, civil environmental engineering. Um, and then he came kind of our way over here, a little south, and went to uh, the Cary Institute in Millbrook, New York, um, where he did his postdoctoral work. Um, so we're very happy to have you here tonight to talk about um, this work that you did, um, looking at winter climate change in northeastern forests. So thank you so much, and welcome, Dr. Fuss. Thanks, Amanda. I really appreciate the, the invitation, for, first of all, and the nice introduction. Um, welcome everybody who's joining us from home or wherever. Um, I, tonight, I'm going to talk about a topic that, that I've um, become more and more interested in over the last um, 10 years or so. Um, and um, before I get started, I want to um, acknowledge that, um, that this work is it's really, um, it's not, a lot of what I'm talking about is not necessarily going to be my own work. And even when it is my work, it's always in collaboration with other people. You know, um, in environmental science, especially, science is almost always a collaborative effort. And um, so with that, I, I have a number of people that I would like to thank. Here's just a sampling of them. Um, um, especially Rebecca, um, um, she's uh, really great at making, introducing this topic and making slides. So she was was um, uh, thoughtful enough to share and allow me to use some of these in my presentation. So um, thanks to her and thanks to these other great uh, collaborators as well. So I want to get started with this. Um, First of all, um, a few questions. Um, I got well. First, let me let me back up a bit and and say that, you know, I've I've been interested in forests since I was um, quite young. Um, Amanda mentioned that I've been in upstate New York now for a number of years, um, but I actually grew up in Nebraska, uh, which, um, if you've never been there, um, yes, there are some forests, but they're few and far between, which I think is one of the reasons that I kind of became more and more interested in forests because they kind of almost had a like a magical quality to them. You know, it's the same type of place where where fairy tales are written about. Um, and so I, you know, coming to upstate New York and starting to study um, ecology as as part of my biology major and then and then more in environmental science, I was really interested in what was going on in the forests around me. And I had the opportunity to start doing research and then start doing winter field work in the forest. And I really love that because, you know, forests are great, but being in a, like being by yourself, 
snowshoeing through a forest is just you know for me it's great because it's just so quiet so peaceful um, and you can really spend time thinking about what's going on around you and so um, one of those things I've been thinking about is how that winter climate is changing and so some of the things what, that I'm going to talk about are relevant in our region across um, the northeastern United States into Canada but you know also in other nor northern climates around the world so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know what the background is on how our climates are changing in the northeast um, especially during winter some of the reasons that we might care about this and then I'll go into a little bit more detail um, not too much detail but a little bit about how we as um, ecosystem ecologists study winter climate change and the effects on forests. You know, it's not necessarily an easy task to design an experiment that can adequately answer those type of questions. So that's something that um, I'm going to teach you a little bit about, I hope. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the forests in the Northeast. I think a lot of us might take these for granted because they're kind of everywhere around us at this time. Um, the Northeastern United States is approximately 70 or a little more percent forested at the moment, which in my opinion is quite a lot given that we have a fairly large population, you know, fairly densely populated um, relative to other parts of the country, but we have this these vast forest lands as well. Um, and a large, uh, you know, if you go back in time, um, a lot of you might realize that this was not always the case. Um, if you go back 100 years ago, the northeastern U.S. looked much different. There were a lot fewer forests and probably a lot more farmland. Um, but farmland gradually ceased and forests have been regrowing for a long time now, for a number of decades at least. Um, so that is something that I want to talk about in terms of what we call ecosystem services. Um, so we take the forest for granted, but they're provide, just by being there, they're providing services for us. Um, and one of those things is, um, that they're because they're growing, they're regrowing from from abandoned farmland or um, reduced forestry practices. They're providing what we call a carbon sink, so they're taking in carbon from from the atmosphere as they're growing, um, and this is at least partially offsetting um, the emissions that we have in this region. You know, it's hard to estimate this with a lot of certainty, but. Um, somewhere between six and 40 percent that's a pretty broad range but you know it's not insignificant you know that carbon offsets are a real thing in our forests um, and we do emit a lot of carbon because we have a lot of people in this region um, another thing that they do um, that a lot of people may or may not be aware of is they retain a lot of nutrients um, specifically nitrogen so nitrogen has a history of being um, elevated in what we call atmospheric deposition. So in rainwater, there's dissolved nitrogen compounds, nitrate and ammonium. And these act as a nutrient um, for forests. Um, and forests retain them um, either in the soils or in the vegetation, um, greater than 90% of what comes in through this deposition. And that's providing a service for us because if the nitrogen is not retained in the forests, then it often gets into the waterways where it can fuel um, blooms of, of um, potentially harmful um, algae. So it protects their, our water quality, surface water quality um, or groundwater quality. Um, and speaking of water, um, forests have the, a function where they really regulate the timing and magnitude of flow for streams and rivers, you know, so providing us um, some buffer against um, extreme events that may cause flooding, you know, in this region. Um, we've seen a few of these things and so we can appreciate the effects of them. So things like Superstorm Sandy or 
or um, the tropical storm Irene about 10 years ago. Those were big events that impacted a lot of different areas of the region um, and would probably have been wor worse if much of our land had not been forested. So uh, other services, of course, um, you know, there are many direct economic uses that we um, gain from our forests um, and of course, recreational uses. All of these things are subject to the climate that we live in. Um, so anything um, that's influenced by the climate around us can be also changed by climate when the climate changes. And so, um, you know, some of you have seen figures like this before. Um, this one in particular kind of um, has an impact on me because it's showing pr different projections of, you know, New York, upstate New York climate um, going forward under potentially different um, carbon emission scenarios. Um, and basically what it, this is showing is that if we continue on a high emission scenario for burning fossil fuels, you know, by the end of the century, we'd be looking at a climate in upstate New York that more resembles what we see in the southern United States currently. If we lower that emission, then we're looking at a climate that's maybe more like the mid-Atlantic. Um, and if we can keep it even lower, then we'll keep it something closer to what we've been used to. Okay, so with that, I want to talk about some of the evidence that we have for um, current or recent climate change in the northern forest region. This is from a recent publication that um, I helped with a number of colleagues. Um, so I've got a, a map of what we consider, you know, this is a very broad definition of the northern forest region um, across um, the northeastern United States and southeastern Canada into the Midwestern region um, through the Great Lakes. And we looked at, you know, a number of sites that had at least 100 years of climate monitoring. And we um, picked out those sites and looked at what kind of trends we've, we've observed. And this, um, this study has been published in a couple of locations. Um, one in the scientific journal ecological applications and then one in a um, more of an outreach style publication um, called science links um, and i if i if somebody reminds me i'll post a link to that um, in the chat and then um, you'll be able to view it uh, you know download it or view it on your screens so we we looked at all these sites and then we we observed what kind of trends were happening um, across the, the greater region, and we saw a number of you know we looked at all these different factors. So one of the obvious things to look at was the number of frost days. And so I'm showing here at all these different monitoring sites uh, the changes over this hundred year period in the number of frost days. A frost day we're defining as very simply, a day when the temperature gets below zero degrees Celsius, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So someday where it freezes. Um, and you'll see that there's variability regionally, but in the Northeastern United States, the trends are the strongest. So in New York, New England, and Southern Canada, um, we have significant declines in the number of frost days each year. Um, so these are all the different sites. Any one that's listed as a red line or a red dot over here means that there is statistically significant decline over that 100 year period, usually showing up as about one to two days per decade. So um, something like 15 to 20 um, days less um, where it gets below freezing, fewer days where it gets below freezing than it did 100 years ago. And we look at other factors, um, you know, so frost days are one thing. What about the number of extreme cold days? So here we're defining an extreme cold day as a day where the temperature gets below negative 18 Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit, you know, significantly colder than just freezing. Um, and again, the Northeastern United States, most of these sites are significantly declining in those days, you know, 
a lot of us, you know, actually probably don't miss these type of days um, that much because they are, you know, they're unpleasant and they can be dangerous for people. Um, but they also have some ecological effects that we, um, you know, that we would miss if they, if they do disappear completely. Um, extreme cold is something that can kill invasive bugs. So here's an example of one thing some of you may have seen. This is the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an invasive um, sap sucking insect that uh, was introduced um, from East Asia um, a number of decades ago. And it's been spreading throughout the Eastern United States. And the effect is that it kills hemlock trees um, over a period of years. And it's really devastated a lot of the eastern hemlock trees if you go further south. So in western North Carolina or Tennessee, Virginia, a lot of those hemlock trees have been killed off. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is definitely present in New York State, um, certainly in the Catskills. Um, and, you know, some of the trees are starting to see the effect of that. So the number of cold days that we get it either can stop or, or at least slow down the spread and take, you know, it makes the, the bugs take longer to kill off these trees, um, which, you know, at least buys us a little bit of time to figure out how to stop them in, with other ways. So this is the current range of hemlock woolly adelgid, and you can see how they're, they're really, they're in New York and they're really at the doorstep of the Adirondacks. Um, where we have a, a number of hemlock trees that I would not want to see disappear. Um, another another factor that you know, so this is an ecological thing I just talked about, but you know, economic or recreational um, effects from winter climate change. What about the number of what we're calling snow making days? So this is relevant for a ski resort, say in Vermont. Um, a snowmaking day is a day when the temperature gets below 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's when um, ski resort managers are able to make snow. So they pump water into their machines and they spray it out and, and usually at nighttime because that's when it's coldest and, and then they fill their slopes with snow. We're looking at the change in the number of snow making days before Christmas, because this is a particularly important number for if you're managing a ski area, because um, if you can get snow on your slopes before Christmas, it's gonna improve your attendance throughout the whole year. You know, if you can be open for skiing by Christmas break, um, that's, that's a, a huge boost to your budget. And so again, um, in the Northeast, these days have been declining. You know, I'll just point out that um, the advances in ski um, um, resorts and how they're, they're making snow has been, you know, they're doing so more energy efficiently and they're like really, they're really pushing the limits um, with what they can do. In fact, that they get, they have, Snow, they have skiing open more days of the year now than they did several decades ago, even though the snow lasts much less time on the ground now because they get such an early start with snow making. If those number, if those days start disappearing um, or continue to disappear, that's going to get harder and harder for them to do. So um, this is a, a good segue into what I'm um, often very concerned with is the um, snowpack that we have on the ground. Um, so this shows a projection, you know, based on increasing winter air temperatures. So here we are in this region, you know, definitely in the red zone of where during the next um, century uh, we're expecting higher and higher air temperatures during the winter. And that's projected to correspond to a decreasing snow cover across the region. So on this map, the red line shows the historic area where the ground was covered by snow for at least 30 days during the winter. Uh, we expect by the end of the century, it's going to be significantly reduced um, to just this white area. So, you know, that doesn't mean it won't snow in some of this other, other area. We just don't expect it to last very long. 
So um, we can think of this as our snow blanket and that snow blanket is shrinking. And I use the term Dr. Fuss, we just lost your audio. It made kind of a crackling noise and then went out. Like maybe something come, came unplugged. I don't know if you're. No, it's just kind of crackling. Yeah, it did sound like a, an electrical, uh, something got fried. Oh, uh, now. Oh, there, there you go. are. Yeah, got that. Okay, yeah, I have no idea what, what happened, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> we lost you right basically as you turned to that slide, so. Yeah, okay. Um, Let me reshare my screen then. Okay, how's that? Perfect, great. Okay, so as um, I started saying, I'm talking about snow being like a blanket because it is this this great insulator. Um, anything below it, um, it has an insulated effect from being underneath of the snow blanket. Um, so you can think of like being in an igloo, you know, it's surprisingly comfortable in there, supposedly. I've never actually been in one, but um, that's why they build them like that. Um, and the effect is that, as I said, so it keeps the heat within the soil, um, prevents it from being lost into the atmosphere. So this, um, you know, protects just the, not just the temperature of the soil, but the things that are living in it. Um, so plant roots, um, so all the trees in our forest have their roots in the soil. Um, there are microbes, um, you know, fungi and bacteria. There are plenty of small animals that rely on this as well. Um, they are uh, living there and they want to be in an environment where they're not exposed to the harshest freezing air temperatures. So um, soil temperature, you know, I, one of the things that I um, kind of center my academic research around and a lot of my teaching interests are how is related to soil and how it functions in the environment. So if you look at soil temperature, um, how that varies throughout the year. So historically in a snow covered, in a winter snow covered um, forest region, your soil temperature graph should look like this throughout the year. When there's snow, the soil temperature, which is this dashed line, is gonna be just over, just over the freezing mark. And then as soon as the snow melts in the spring, then of course the soil temperature starts going up quickly and peaks during the summer. And the process starts over and over again. But if we lose that snowpack, then obviously that temperature profile can be disturbed. So without that insulating blanket, that heat, um, you know, from the snow, from the soil uh, layers, can escape into the atmosphere. And the effect of that, of course, is that then those soil temperatures can start going below the freezing point, and you get soil freezing. So this, I'll, I'm going to point out, is you know something that might be a little bit counterintuitive because we're, I'm talking about losing the snowpack due to warmer temperatures, warmer air temperatures. And that 
ending up um, causing more soil freezing. So that, you know, that's an effect that you might not think of. Um, we call this um, sort of a paradox, like um, I believe uh, warmer, uh, colder soils in a warmer world is, is the term that some of us like to throw around, um, you know, to help explain why, how snow is such an important insulating factor and what the effect is. Because even if the air temperatures are warmer during the winter, it doesn't mean it's not gonna get cold. You know, we have weather that's incredibly variable. You know, we go from warm spells to very cold spells. If we don't have that snowpack build up or it disappears midwinter, that's when those soils can be exposed to freezing. So next I wanna talk about some of the experiments that we've done where we've looked at the effects of soil freezing. Um, the experiments that I'm gonna talk about have been conducted at a place called the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. Hubbard Brook is a, um, it's a research forest operated by the US Forest Service. So it's federal property um, and it's used by um, both federal scientists, but primarily academic scientists from a number of different colleges and universities, not only in our region, but around the world. It's got a long history of important ecological research that's in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. This was actually the first place where acid rain was discovered in North America in the early 1960s. And um, since then, um, scientists have been conducting lots of long-term monitoring of you know, all sorts of things, forest health, water quality, lots of um, individual ecological studies. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about, it's been the site of numerous winter climate change studies. So um, the first uh, soil freezing experiment that was done at Hubbard Brook was um, done during the winters of 1998, 1999. And you might be wondering, well, how would a scientist um, design an experiment to study soil freezing? You know, I said that if the snowpack is developing, then the soils underneath shouldn't really freeze very much. Um, but if you want to study something, you kind of have to make it happen. You can't just wait for a year where it does happen. Um, you have to be ready for it. So the obvious way to do that is to remove um, that insulating blanket. So just basically going out, making plots in the woods and shoveling them. Um, so you're getting rid of that snow insulation. And so they did this for a couple of winters. They had designated plots that they were gonna keep clear of snow and then measure a number of different effects within these plots. And one thing that really stood out, um, I'll walk you through this figure. Um, so a lot of these plots have um, kind of one of our favorite tree species in it, sugar maple. And something that um, these scientists noticed is that in the plots that got shoveled, um, which, I'm, which are being called the treatment plots here, these are the white circles um, compared to the reference plots the unshoveled plots are the black circles. These plots had in the soil, the soil water, I should say, much more nitrate, which is a nitrogen containing nutrient. Um, so present in soil water, soil solution. This is stuff that um, plants or microbes can utilize as a nitrogen source um, for their nutritional needs. And so in the plots with a lot of sugar maple, um, the plots that got shoveled and where the soils froze, they had a lot more nitrate leaching out of them um, into the soil solution. So you might be wondering, okay, why does that matter? Well, for one thing, I, as, as I said, nitrogen is this nutrient for trees. So potentially that means that because it's spilling out into the soil solution, that it's not gonna be an available um, nutrient for the trees. And this is kind of what was observed. So if you think about um, trees below ground, they've got all these roots. What happened with the soil freezing was it killed off some of the fine roots of these sugar maples. 
For some reason, sugar maple is more susceptible to this frost damage than some of the other tree species in the area. So their fine roots were killed off to some extent. And because of that, during the following summer, during the growing season, they were unable to take up as much of this nutrient, which caused this increase during the summer months um, of nitrate concentrations. So another reason you might care about that, um, so maybe it's nutrients that the trees are no longer able to get. Well, if they're not taking it up, then that nitrate might make its way into, uh, through the soil water, into the groundwater, into the streams, into our rivers, eventually into the coastal areas. Um, excess nitrogen coming out of the landscape is, as I mentioned earlier, a nutrient that can be over enriching aquatic areas and potentially causing eutrophication or these algal blooms. So we know that, um, as I mentioned, that seemed like sugar maples might be um, especially vulnerable to the soil freezing. Um, and this has been followed up in other studies. Um, so here's another shoveling experiment that was done more recently. And they noted some similar things. Um, but here they actually kept track of the growth of individual trees in plots that they were shoveling for five consecutive years. So during these five um, winters, they're then measuring the tree growth um, during the following, over the course of the following year. And they noticed that again, there's this divergence between the reference group, which is the gray circles here, they're growing a little bit faster than the snow removal um, plot trees. So it seemed like that probably that root damage was allowing them to take up less, fewer nutrients and therefore grow less during each subsequent year. And then the, in this publication, these authors kind of took this um, the, over the, the range of sugar maple throughout the Northeast and then the climate projections Basically, they developed this, what is called a forest vulnerability index um, for soil frost. So the locations that are gonna be susceptible to soil frost increases, plus have a lot of sugar maples. So you see, um, of course, Vermont, you know, famous for its uh, maple syrup and fall foliage, also in the Adirondack region of New York, of course. Um, and the broader region. Uh, so that's one approach. Um, using these, these shoveled plots um, is one approach to studying soil freezing. But you know, this any sort of method you use um, in, a, in a scientific study is always subject to some criticism or your own doubt about whether it's realistic. You know, is shoveling a plot the same as as the natural process that would happen. Um, so, you know, we wanted to follow up this type of study with looking at um, the effects of, of snowpack and soil freezing without doing a manipulation, without shoveling, which of course made it easier when you don't have to go out and shovel every time it snows. So we wanted to ask, can we do this without, um, can we find places on the landscape where this may not be necessary, where we can act, actually observe different um, characteristics between snowpack and soil frost without, without inducing it ourselves. So um, there's a hypothetical relationship depending on elevation. Um, you know, it snows more at higher elevation compared to lower elevation. And then there's a difference between north facing slopes and south facing slopes. North facing slopes tend to be colder and get more snow. Um, south facing slopes, less so. So if that relationship holds up, we would expect that in lower elevation locations, especially on south facing slopes, we'd have less snow and potentially more soil freezing, uh, while the opposite being true on at the higher elevations. And so we set out at the same uh, Hubbard Brook experimental forest to try to test this. Um, I've got this map, which might be a little bit hard to read, but the main point is that the Hubbard Brook experimental forest is kind of shaped like a bowl 
where there's a lower elevation part along this main stream in the middle, and then it's surrounded by the mountains that go up. Um, you can kind of see some of that landscape here. And that we thought was maybe enough to observe some of these differences. And so we had some colleagues who uh, work at a place called the um, Cold Region Engineering. It's something that the, the Army does. Um, you know, the Army has been researching snow for, for decades because they're interested in all sorts of things about engineering and can they drive tanks on it, for instance. <laughs> um, but they have all these computer models where they look at um, snow accumulation predictions. And they did this for the Hubbard Brook Valley. And they came up with, you know, a day 60 of the year. So this would be the beginning of March, basically. Um, across the Hubbard Brook Valley, they're predicting deeper snow along these. This is a north facing slope up here. This is the south facing slopes over here. Higher elevation at the perimeter um, means deeper snow, much less snowpack in the middle of the valley down here. And so we use that information and we set up a number of plots. These are the red dots on this map um, that kind of took advantage of that natural gradient. And we set up these plots. Um, and then we, within each one, we did, an, you know, we had a number of people working there, but one of the primary things was to measure, you know, confirm are we observing what, what we think we're going to observe between snowpack and soil freezing. So we measure, we keep careful records of the changes in snow depth, which is pretty easy to do. But then measuring soil freezing is, is, is a little bit more complicated. Um, the way we typically do it is with, um, freeze tubes or frost tubes that are filled with a substance that changes color uh, when it freezes. So normally it's a blue color called methylene blue dye. When it's frozen, it turns clear. So you, this is a tube that goes down into the ground and you can pull it up and measure the depth of this frozen part. And we do that every week or so. And so um, I'm not going to take you through every um, example from every plot, but here is, was the beginning of the study during the winter of 2011. Um, and on this figure, you can see a few things. So with time, the, as the snowpack was fairly low in centimeters, you know, less than 20 centimeters, there was actually a few centimeters of soil freezing that occurred. As the snowpack built up more, that soil fr uh, frost tended to go away a little bit. So it was very shallow if, if present at all throughout the rest of the winter. The next winter was actually quite different. Um, here's an example from a lower elevation plot. Um, so in this particular winter at this lower elevation plot, there was much less snow and you can see considerably more soil freezing um, to a greater depth. So it, the, based on this and, and a number of other measurements that we did, um, our predictions did work out pretty well. So one of the things that I was interested in um, is if you, if you remember back, I talked about the nitrate losses in soil solution. I wanted to measure if that same thing is occurring across all these different plots. You know, I'll show you this map. Again, we had 20 of these different plots that we think are gonna be a gradient between more and less soil freezing. So across those 20 plots, I would predict something like the greater amount of soil frost, um, the deeper it goes, we would expect more nitrate losses during the following growing season, you know, in some sort of hypothetical linear relationship like this. Um, but <laughs> what, what I actually found was um, in terms of nitrate with soil frost depth, Absolutely nothing, actually. This, like, this data shows zero pattern, no increase. Um, this is about as flat as you can get real data. Um, in both the organic horizon, this is the forest floor, the, um, the topsoil, you might call it, or, and then deeper into the mineral horizon, the subsoil. Um, no effect in either location. 
So what does that mean? Hmm. Where this is a little bit confusing. Um, why they why they have such strong results when there was um, induced soil freezing versus here? Um, well, another thing that I looked at was carbon. Um, so there's a hint of this pattern here, um, and I'll mention that here we're measuring what's called dissolved organic carbon. So in the same soil water, there's carbon that's dissolved. Um, it's organic form. You can think of this as being like soil tea. So if you brew tea, you're, you're dissolving, you're releasing um, organic carbon from those tea leaves into, into, the, um, into the water. Uh, well, soil water is doing the same thing as it passes through the organic soil. It's bringing some of that carbon with it. So there's a hint of some pattern, like the more soil freezing it's not great, but there is some hint of a positive relationship, at least. Um, I looked a little bit further, and then there's a much clearer um, example of a positive relationship between the soil P T, um, the dissolved carbon, organic carbon, um, with a variable that we call um, temperature. Uh, we call this the SDL winter soil temperature, which um, Sparing you the details is a measure of the variability of a particular site's soil temperature during the winter, so how much it goes up and down. And this is important because it's an indicator of the number of freeze-thaw cycles that that site is going to experience. Um, so the more variable um, the soil temperature is due to lower uh, snowpack, um, the more times that soil can go through both freezing and thawing processes. And so what I think happened here is that, oops, um, sorry, uh, that what happened, that freezing and thawing repeatedly of that soil is sort of like breaking up, you know, the topsoil is made up of all this, um, you know, if you've been in the forest, there's plenty of uh, leaves, um, at various layers of decomposition underneath. If you're freezing and thawing that stuff repeatedly, it's sort of fragmenting it, or, or and then that allows for more surface area to release um, stuff as water flows across it or through it. So I think that's what's happening, what's causing the release of organic carbon. Now, how does that relate to nitrogen? Well, there are many complex interactions in how carbon and nitrogen cycle in the soils. But what we think is happening here is that the freeze, the freeze thaw induced release of organic carbon from the topsoil is providing an energy source for the microbes living in the soil underneath of it, so the fungi and the bacteria. So by having that energy source, that carbon available to them, it's like motivating them to take up nitrogen as well. So carbon, um, if you know much about our own nutrition, like think of this as like, suddenly you're getting, somebody's giving you a bunch of sugar, that's your energy source, that's your carbon source, um, but it doesn't have a lot of nutritional value. At some point you're gonna go, you're gonna have to go out and you're gonna have to find some protein, something with nitrogen in it. Um, so plants, microbes, they do the same kind of thing. So um, that's one example of, of the kind of thing that we look at in terms of the effects in soil, um, of soil freezing, uh, the effects within the soils. Um, I'm, I've shown this figure already, uh, the soil profile, the soil temperature profile throughout the year. Um, so, you know, I talked about what happens if this goes below zero or oscillates around with freeze-thaw cycles. Of course, the soil still exists and is actually much more active during the summer. Um, so that's something that you know, want to keep in mind is you know, what's happening in the winter and during the summer. Um, we know that, you know, I said winters are getting uh, warmer faster than the summers, but of course the summers are also getting warmer. We're predicting more days, for example, on this map above 90 degrees. Those are obviously going to occur during the summer, not the winter. Um, so how is that interaction going to work? And so this is another thing that's 
um, being studied currently at Hubbard Brook. It's been ongoing for a few years now. And it's a really cool experiment called the Climate Change Across Seasons Experiment. Um, we call it C-Case for short. And in this experiment, we are changing the soil climate through all four seasons of the year. So this is not just a manipulation of the snowpack in the winter to change the soil temperature. We're changing the soil temperature throughout the whole year. And to do this, um, really the, there's a, you know, people have thought about how to warm up soils, but the most logical way to do it is to directly heat them. And that's by burying heating cables in the soil um, and, and, turn, and running electricity through them to warm them up. And by doing this, you can actually um, either dial up or down the temperature that you're increasing it by. Um, so an uh, added benefit is that you can induce these freeze-thaw cycles to study both processes at the same time. And then we can measure um, on these different plots, the responses in the trees, the soil microbes, et cetera. So here's a few images of what this looks like. There are in over, you know, these are relatively small plots, um, but to warm up the soil, you have to run a lot of cable through it. Um, so there are over two miles of buried cable in these plots that are just a, a I think a couple of acres, I'd say. Um, so they're buried in these little trenches, like you can see here, kind of back and forth. And they're, they're um, powered through this control room that uh, runs current through it um, at a designated amount um, that's calibrated to warm up the soil, of, um, I believe, three degrees above what it would normally be, or five degrees, perhaps. Um, and so a few images of what this looks like. This is a thermal image um, that shows these lines. That's where the heating cables are. So you can see that that soil is releasing heat because it's being warmed from underneath. And so with this um, experiment, um, they are looking at both warmer soils during the growing season um, and then shrinking the snowpack during the winter and inducing these freeze-thaw cycles and kind of looking at the combination of them because these things in the real world are going to happen in combination with each other so it's best to um, look at the, the ways that they interact. So this research is ongoing, but so far it is confirming that freeze-thaw cycles do damage the roots of maple trees and disrupt their nutrient uptake for nitrogen. Um, but this might be partially, at least partially offset by increases in root growth during the summer. Um, another thing that they've observed is that the trees have more summer sap flow and therefore use more water. So this has implications for um, soil moisture throughout the growing season. You know, if we're gonna be, you know, we don't necessarily think of our forests as being particularly, particularly drought prone relative to other regions, um, but water can be fairly limiting in um, certain circumstances in the soils, um, which has a tendency to impact certain um, plants or um, animals more than others. So I want to um, wrap this up with a few um, messages. Our northern forest regions are important ecologically and economically. Um, climate change is a real threat to them, um, the way they function and the way that we use them. And winter has historically been very much overlooked in the way we think about climate change, um, even though here it's actually where it's happening fastest. Um, but, and I want you to, if nothing else, Keep in mind that what happens in the forest during the winter does affect it throughout the rest of the year, um, the way that the trees grow in the, in the summer based on their root morphology and the way they take up nutrients, et cetera. Okay, with that, um, I'd be happy to take questions and I thank you for your attention. Wow, that was really, that's some really cool stuff. <clears throat> 
Um, first off, uh, if you wouldn't mind, you mentioned that you would um, put the link for that oh, report yeah. you were talking about. Yeah, let me. Um, I think I have. Yeah, so I'll just put it right in the chat here. Perfect. Okay, so that's through the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation, who um, has who published this report um, with all the all a lot of the trends that I talked about, plus a number of other things. Awesome. Okay, um, I had some questions while people are thinking. Um, you talked about um, looking at the the slopes. And I was just curious, like, what scale do you expect to see differences? Because we have these sand dunes in the pine bush, and some of our sand dunes are like 100 feet tall. You know, is that a big enough height? Would you expect to see those differences? Um, it's probably not a big enough height to, like, have a difference in the amount of precipitation that falls there, you know, where the snowpack um, naturally builds up more or less because of differences in precipitation. But, you know, this, that type of topography, I imagine, um, you know, snow accumulates more or less in certain parts just based on, um, you know, the way the wind carries it through the system and stuff. So you can still see, um, I would imagine you can still see patterns uh, but I don't exactly know what they would look like. <laughs> Let's just yeah, we're trying to, we're in the or process. how consistent they would be. Um, yeah, we're in the process of trying to document a little bit of climate kind of information. We have data loggers on those sand dunes on the north and south facing slopes and on the tops and bottoms. So that kind of clicked a little bit. Yeah, and something I didn't mention, um, but um, not all soils are created equally in terms of their susceptibility to soil. I mean, you can go on and on about soil frost and there are different types of soil frost, but sandier soils um, tend to form what we call granular soil frost because they're not saturated. So as opposed to like a clay rich, um, um, lower elevation soil um, or in some sort of depositional zone or a lot of agricultural soils that have been churned up um, through plowing and are much more homogenous. Um, they are more likely to form what's called concrete frost. And that's the, that's the type of soil freezing that actually impairs water, prevents water infiltration and causes more flooding. Sandier soils don't usually do that. Um, yeah, I thought that was way, an interesting perspective too, was that the soils had a lot to do with it, which, yeah. Right. Yeah, soils are incredibly important in like, how any type of ecosystem functions. So um, they do a lot, even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, um, I had another, and I don't know if you want to bring back up the slide, but when you were talking about those slope differences and you had a high and you had a low, it almost looked like the relationship between snowpack and then the soil freezing depth, I think it was, or was it? Um, was almost like inversely related in the in the low area. Um, you're talking the slope, um, so like. Hmm. Is this what you're talking about? Like the data that you actually collect. Oh, the data. Um, yeah. Okay. So that one, so that one, the higher one seemed to be like the, the soil frost depth almost followed the snowpack. So it was freezing, like not, it, it was freezing, not as deep as there was more snowpack, but when in the lower elevation, it seemed to be almost, I was, conf yeah, I guess I was curious what you thought. Yeah, that seems like the more snowpack, the deeper the freeze in the soil. Yeah, I, I think um, 
uh, I just pulled out a couple of examples that I, I thought illustrated the point well. Um, and I think if you look at more and more of these, you can probably pull out some patterns. I think there's some sort of threshold for snowpack depth, which um, automatically is going to make the, you know, like below, let's say 20 centimeters or something, makes that. And once it's a much above 20 centimeters for very long, then the soil frost. Um, doesn't persist because it's enough of a buffer between the atmosphere temperature and the soil temperature, which is much more constant below that depth. Um, does that sort of get at what you're? Yeah, I think so. I figured, you know, yeah, because I was like, you only showed two examples. So I'm sure there's other things, like you said, you know, that are impacting these things. Yeah, and it, it, it also, re there's a lot of factors that are hard to control for, like, Okay, so um, the beginning of the winter, you know, snow starts and in, in the snow starts accumulating probably in November, early December. Um, the soil moisture from year to year can vary quite a bit. Um, that's going to affect, like, so depending on how much moisture there is in the soil, it has a different heat capacity. So it's going to freeze it's going to take longer to freeze or freeze to a different extent, um, depending on that. You know, there are factors that we can't really control for. Um, but I think with enough years of monitoring this kind of thing, those those patterns become more clear. Yeah, we have these things, we call them frost pockets in between the dunes, like that you get in the spring and the fall where the, uh, the cold air kind of gets trapped in the low areas between the dunes. Um, and so they tend to be a little bit colder down there um, in the spring, or at least that's what we notice. That's what we're hoping to document with our data loggers. And so um, I guess I was kind of curious if maybe that would was a result of that. But I do see now that it's two different years. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, which I, I picked because there was a clear difference at all the sites between these two years. You know, this this was a year. I mean, it, the snowpack didn't necessarily develop super early. But it did last quite a while, well into April and um, almost to May, actually, at the higher elevations. While um, in 2012, it was like gone by mid to late March, almost everywhere. Hmm. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Uh, somebody asks, how does this impact uh, maple syrup production and development of pine cones? Maple syrup production is something people are definitely concerned about because I think there's some data that suggests that um, the increasing soil freezing decreases the sap flow during the spring, um, even if it's compensated with, with what's happening during the summer. Um, but during the syrup production time um, could be impacted. I, that is like the tree physiology thing is not is not my specialty, so I don't want to say with certainty that that's a resolved issue, but it's syrup producers are very concerned about this. Let's just say that. And then, and then the the pine cone. What was the the second part was about pine cone? Yeah. Yeah, which I know even less about, so <laughs> um, I'm not going to attempt to to say too much there. Good, good question though. It's certainly an interesting topic. Um, we have another professor on tonight, uh, Dan Capuano from Hudson Valley Community College. Um, he asks, are there other sites in the US um, where similar research is being conducted? Yeah, there is. Um, um, so some similar research is being conducted in Massachusetts um, at another long-term ecological research site called the Harvard Forest. Um, so they, they have similar National Science Foundation funding to run some experiments and, and some of the same group that worked at Hubbard Brook does kind of partner studies at Harvard Forest. Um, in the Adirondacks um, at uh, Huntington Forest, which is um, uh, research and management forest for SUNY ESF, there have been a few kind of winter climate change, more focused on snow melt um, and how that's um, um, 
carrying nutrients to streams. Um, uh, certainly in the western United States, there's interest in snowpack development um, in Colorado. Um, internationally, there's, there's certain groups in northern Europe. Um, there's a group that's very active in Sweden that does a lot of really cool manipulations. In Japan, they, they, they're, they've been working on this type of research for a while as well. Um, so you mentioned, you talked at the beginning of your talk about how we're very forested right now um, and how historically we weren't, it was much more open. Um, and there's uh, this push in the Northeastern United States to try and bring back some of that early successional or what we call young forest habitat to try and facilitate that for the wildlife that we see like declining in response to the decline of that particular habitat. Do you think uh, is, is one particular a forest or young forest or grassland is one of them particularly better at buffering us from these effects um, from climate change? Um, I don't know about um, grasslands at all, but um, I would imagine it's good to have a variety of forest ages. Um, so having some younger ones, um, because I think, you know, naturally during the forest succession, there is certain species transitions and, and, and um, you might have um, greater ability to, you know, there's a lot of faster growing species that are present in the younger forests um, that might be better equipped to handle um, changing conditions um, and potentially buffer, you know, if, if um, protecting the carbon sink of our forests, and, you know, obviously having younger, faster growing forests um, is, is a priority. Um, um, and the same is probably true if you're talking about nutrient retention, if you're trying to keep nitrogen from flowing into surface water, groundwaters and surface waters, um, having faster growing forests that are younger as opposed to the slower growing older forests um, are potentially beneficial. That's good to know. <laughs> and I would, I would imagine just having that diversity of age um, allows you to have a little bit more resilience, but you know, I don't know if that's conclusive. I think that's what a lot of the plan, the plans um, aim to do is, you know, have it kind of moving around, you know, um, so kind of creating more of a mosaic. Right. And, but it, you're right. It's certainly an issue for um, wildlife habitat and birds, et cetera. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll put out one more call for questions. Please feel free to type them in the Q&A or um, the chat box. Um, thank you all so much for attending. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture and a really, I thought a really great way to kind of sum up a, this huge and multivariate analysis of um, trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a challenging topic to, um, to, to study. Um, I think it's important um, and it's, you know, it's, it's fun in a way that it, it allows us to be creative with how to design these things. Um, you know, to kind of look at the same types of questions with different experimental approaches, either observational by like using this natural gradient difference or experimentally either by warming soil or, or getting rid of snow or both. Um, you know, we're kind of trying to tackle the issue from multiple angles at once. Yeah, and I think that idea of like one 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 question leading to another question, you know, like how you found out, figured out why the nitrogen was, I was, I was blown away by that. <laughs> I didn't really, and then you kind of explained <laughs> yeah, how you I, figured it out. I'd be hesitant about the, using the term figured out because, you know, it's not, <laughs> this is, this is our best guess um, at, the, at the moment. Um, it's interesting because there was this huge nitrogen response the first time. They did another shoveling experiment where they didn't get such a nitrogen response, but there was this differing carbon response and kind of mechanistically it makes sense um, just in terms of the way that, you know, microbes are pretty good at sucking up these nutrients if they have some food to go along with it. Um, so, you know, we think that's probably what's happening and in a sense that that might be 
you know, reassuring that, that they're there for us to help prevent these nutrient losses that the trees can't keep up with. All right, getting comments. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, Bert says, I would su suspect the wood and paper industry are inter interested or funding this type of research. Have you gotten any? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure they're interested in it for, for multiple reasons. Certainly just the, you know, historically, and I'm not a logger um, at all, but winter is an important time for forestry because you know, historically it's just a lot easier to, to um, take logs out of the woods um, on snow rather than on bare ground, especially muddy ground. Um, so I didn't talk about that so much, but that's another thing is, you know, that's another metric that we look at, um, the number of bare grounds, e uh, bare ground days each um, each year or the another or the, the length of what we call the mud season in the spring. Um, so those things are certainly relevant to um, using the forests for, for activities such as um, wood or paper um, production. Good to get them involved and get the people who maybe have some money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll call it for the night. Thank you so, so very much for giving an excellent presentation tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, that was fun. Great. Okay, everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, you too.